Representative Mari Levitt, and I have the privilege and honor of serving the beautiful 28th Legislative District. And before we begin hearing questions that you may have and talking about the issues that are important to you, I want to turn it over to my colleagues who are kind enough to join us. We have city officials, county officials, our resident expert in public health from the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. So this really is a state, county, and, and city effort to ensure that we're taking care of residents in Pierce County. So I will turn it over to Dr. Chen to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Dr. Anthony Chen. I'm Director of Health of the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. And Madam Council Ladenberg. Hi, uh, this is Connie Ladenberg. Uh, I'm on the County Council. I represent District 4, which is kind of the north end of Tacoma, downtown, um, South Tacoma. And then I also have uh, Fircrest and all of University Place, which is a part of Mari's district too. Thank you, Council Member Campbell. Thank you, Marty, and thank you for having me here today. Marty Campbell, Pierce County Council, District Number Five, uh, East Side, South End, Tacoma, Midland, Parkland, Spenway, Summit, Waller, Clover Creek. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, Mayor Woodards. Uh, Mayor Woodards, you there? You you already you already introduced <laughs> myself, but seriously, um, Victoria Woodards, Mayor of what I believe is the greatest city um, in the world, Tacoma, Washington. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think we've all done our introductions. Dr. Chen, you went already, didn't I introduce you? I think I started with you. Great. So we're gonna go ahead and um, we hope that you will be kind enough to ask questions that are on your mind. We know that this is a really challenging time that we're in. It's, it's unprecedented in the time that, that folks have been in office and certainly um, in past history. And so we know that folks are suffering and are, eager to learn about resources that are available to them and their families and also get information. So uh, as I get questions in, I'll go ahead and um, ask a council member or Mayor Woodards or Dr. Chen, depending on the nature of the question, to go ahead and jump in. And as folks respond, for those, or my colleagues, if you wanna um, add something of a resource that you're aware of or something that the county or the city, the health department is doing, please, Feel free to jump in at any time as well. And um, first question um, comes from Joel, who's interested in having some WDFW lands reopened, especially ones that are close to residential neighborhoods. And, and related to that it has to do with our veterans who are very concerned about access to hunting and fishing opportunities. And because these activities are especially important to those with mental health struggles. And, and um, thank you, Joel, for that question. There, are many folks who are interested in opening up those areas. I, as a daughter of a strong hunter and, and fisherman and a veteran as well, um, I certainly understand um, the peace of mind that that provides for our veterans who are able to get out on those lands um, and have that fresh air. And so I know that the governor's office and there are several legislators as well who are concerned, Joel, that, about the very question that you ask, as well as our veterans being able to get out on the land and, and do those fishing and um, hunting activities and also ensure that the um, folks who are staffing those areas and um, are also being healthy. And so there are groups working to open up those areas and if and hopefully that will be soon, but they're making sure that opening up those areas doesn't mitigate um, a relapse in the great effort that's being done to keep people healthy and safe and flatten the curve. So, but it is a very important issue and question and thank you for asking it. Dr. Chen, anything you wanna add or Vic Mayor Woodards? I was just, I was just gonna add and I didn't do so in my introduction. Um, I just wanted to be really clear that while it looks like I'm on a beach, I am not. Um, you know, we all have to find ways to cope with COVID-19. And so one of the ways I find coping with COVID-19 is to change my background, which when I look at myself, it makes me smile to think at some point, um, I will be back on a beach one day, but I am in Tacoma social distancing myself, but I just wanted to share, um, wanted to share that so people don't think their mayor is on a beach hanging out while we're going through this crisis. Great. Thank you. Any, any other comments on that particular issue? If not, I'll, Dr. Chen? Yes, um, I think there, you know, 
um, Rep Representative Levitt, as, as you've said, is, you know, we, we just have- I think to you covered it very well, thank you. Pull in terms of how we start to ease this res these restrictions. When you look at the number of cases that we have in Pierce County, um, our cumulative case count is about a thousand right now. That's less than 1% of our Pierce County population, which says over 99% of our population is not immune to this. And when you think about it, the Puget Sound area, right? So Kings, Nahomish, and Pierce are, are way ahead in terms of case counts than other counties in the state. I have heard from my colleagues in more rural counties, they're very concerned that when people show up on the beaches or they, they show up in the hunting areas or the fishing areas, that people are moving significant distances. So, so while you're out there, it, there might not be that many people out there, but you're, you're coming from an area where there's a high rate of illness to an area where there's low rate of illness. You also, uh, you know, um, some people are also driving long distances and along the way, they might be stopping in restaurants and, and so on. Um, and then also, um, I do a little bit of fishing, not a whole lot, but I know there's some places like when I used to live in West Seattle, you know, during salmon season, people are shoulder to shoulder um, and trying to tell people not to be shoulder to shoulder on the pier or on the beach um, can be challenging. So while the concept is good and important, I think we you know, still have to consider what's the impact, um, you know, when, when a lot of people decide to go um, and enjoy the outdoors. Um, and so, so that's something that we have to be careful with. I know that Metro Parks and some of the other park districts are getting together to talk proactively about how they might be able to do this in a, a controlled fashion uh, and, and not, you know, uh, not for it to become very confusing or piecemeal as you move from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction. Right. Mari, Mari, can yeah. I respond? Yes, please, Madam. Uh, Thanks. Dr. Chin brought up our local parks. Um, we have a situation out of Chambers Bay, actually, uh, currently, where a few weeks ago, before we actually had the real stay at home kind of order come through, um, but you still weren't supposed to congregate, I went out to Chambers Bay and it was probably more people out there that day than I have seen ever out there. Both all the parking lots, all the streets, everyone, everything was full. People were not staying very far apart from each other because they couldn't because there's so many people, even on the trail. So now that it's closed, the park itself is closed um, to, to parking. You can't go in there to park. People, the park district wants people to be able to walk to their parks. They don't necessarily want people to drive because that just encourages more and more people. It's frustrating because this wonderful weather that we've been having, the first thing you wanna do is go out to your park. Um, but the important thing is to make sure that we do maintain those separation um, spaces, um, keep that virus away from us. And so we have to kind of sacrifice a little bit right now until we can really get healthy in our community. But um, it is challenging to try to find what that medium is, you know, where people can actually still enjoy life um, and, you know, not feel like they're resentful to everything that we're trying to do to protect our people. Thank you. I'm gonna move on to the next question and this has to do with unemployment and, and already having issues getting through um, to employment security and uncertain about when benefits will begin and eligibility criteria. Um, and you know, we are, are receiving several questions about unemployment and, and our hearing from constituents across the state that they can't get through or they applied and they were instantly denied even though the rules have changed and the eligibility um, criteria for unemployment has expanded. And so we've been on, when I say we, legislators have been on calls weekly with the governor's office, with employment security, our Department of Commerce, Department of Health, and we raise this issue on a regular basis. I know that Employment Security Department is working around the clock. They have ramped up, they have hired more staff and are continuing to ensure that the technology keeps up with the volume of applications that they're getting in and what deployment or Department of Employment Security um, 
has told us they have a great FAQ sheet um, and they're asking folks to go to that FAQ and determine um, the criteria that best fits for your application. And so when you do that first, then you'll be queued up and ready to go for the application. And that will help the staff who are working around the clock to process those applications to get those out sooner. But we know that that's a barrier and they have ramped up significantly in their hires and are working around the clock to get that to um, to get those dollars out the door. The other thing in the Federal CARES Act, there's been an expansion for self proprietors. So if you think of um, artists, musicians, hairdressers, um, they often don't have access to unemployment insurance and will through the Federal CARES Act. And so they will be able to apply this week. Um, and the information is on the Employment Security Department FAQ, FAQ uh, sites. And I would encourage folks to go there um, and to keep trying. What I've heard from Employment Security and what we've been told by the commissioner is if those denials come instantly, um, you will be in the queue and an employment will get out to folks. Uh, it's just a matter of taking time to process those applications and those applications and the funding that folks will get will be retroactive to the time that they were eligible. So you're going to get the dollars that um, is due to you and it's just been a really frustrating process I think by all um, to get through employment security but they are working around the clock because they want to serve you and, and get those dollars out to people. Any other comments from folks who want to respond? Mm -hmm. Okay, the next one is for Dr. Chen. I have a question for Dr. Chen. Are the new cases family infection or is it more community spread at this point? Dr. Chen, would you kindly answer that? Yeah, the infection, uh, you know, COVID-19 infection is widespread in our community right now. Um, there probably is some within families, but pretty much, you know, any region of our county has cases in it. So it, it is out there in the community. Great, and a, a, a follow-up question of where can people get testing in Pierce County recently, or can they get tested if they're not a healthcare worker or an essential worker who's going um, to provide services to people? So Representative Levitt, you've indicated some of the high priority groups mm -hmm. can get tested. Um, there are also other high priority groups such as people who are over 60, uh, people who have chronic illnesses, um, essential workers, and um, I know the mayor always reminds me the transit workers are essential workers, but you know, healthcare workers, people who work in grocery stores, the people who are working in the essential businesses that are still open. However, um, what I encourage people to do is if they think they're sick, they should contact their healthcare provider. Um, you know, it, you know, if they have usual symptoms, I mean, it's hard for us to tell whether it's, a, you know, a, a flu or one of the other respiratory illnesses or COVID-19. Uh, certainly, if they're getting sicker, they should contact the healthcare provider. I think we're very fortunate that um, both of our large healthcare systems, um, Multicare and CHI Franciscan, um, and, and Kaiser as well, I understand, um, they also have online, uh, you know, virtual visits, so people um, are having a hard time or they choose um, to do so, they can consult with a physician virtually. Um, so for CTI consistent and, and Multicare, they're currently waiving the fee for that. Um, both of them also have established a network of sites throughout the county that um, are specifically designated to do triage and testing. Um, and my understanding, those move very quickly um, it, it, I've heard numbers like 15 minutes, you know, you, you call, get the appointment and what between the time you arrive and, and they um, check you out, decide if you need to be tested, um, that it, it takes about 15 minutes for people to get through that. That's been a great um, service for them to offer because it has really reduced the demand on the emergency rooms. You know, at any time of the year, we want to make sure that people are not crowding the emergency rooms when they don't need to be, so that the, the sickest people who need the emergency rooms can do that. But they've been very successful um, in having these kind of designated triage and testing sites. So um, I would encourage people to use one of those options to access a provider and get tested if necessary. Great. Thank you. Any other one want to comment on that question? 
Well, I know the next question is one that we hear also quite a bit about, and it, and it comes as the small business uh, small businesses want to get back to work, hoping for less restrictions going former, forward, and the small business um, businesses are struggling. And we hear across the states, uh, whether rural or urban areas, um, across industry and, and sectors, that they uh, need relief and they need help. And our small businesses are the backbone of our economy and, and create a lot of jobs. So we want to do everything we can to support them. I'm going to throw this out there, um, Mayor, to you. If you want to just talk um, quickly and then we'll let others chime in and then I'll jump in as well of um, what you've been hearing from local businesses about the needs in, in the city of Tacoma. Oh, Mayor, we can't hear you. Sorry. There you go. Um, thank you for the question, um, uh, for, the, for the submitter of the question. So there are, um, I mean, what we're hearing is the same exact thing you just said. Um, small businesses are the basis of our economy and, and we need them to be up and we need them to be running. We need them to be strong and we need them to be healthy. Um, so I'll just throw out a couple of resources, some things that have been happening in Tacoma Pierce County. One is um, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 11 o'clock, the Tacoma Pierce County Chamber and the Economic Development Board have a call for small business, for businesses, um, for all businesses. And I want to tell you, um, I've been dialing in. They've had some really great guests who are giving out a lot of really good information. So the first thing I'll say is make sure if you haven't dialed into that call, you can go to either one of their websites and get the call information, look up who the guests are. Um, they've been doing everything from talking about SBA loans to the loans that we're doing here at the city. And I'll get to that in just a second. Um, talking to people from the federal side, the state side, the local side. Um, they've been very productive providing a lot of information. And you can also ask questions and get answers there as well. Um, what we've done here in Tacoma for our small businesses are a couple of things. Number one, if you are a small business in the city of Tacoma and you pay B&O tax of less than $10,000 a year, we you, normally you're paying B&O tax on a quarterly basis. We are suspending all payments of B&O tax and you don't have to pay until the end of the year and you will not accrue any penalties or interest. So that's one thing we're doing. The other thing um, that we've done um, is we were able to set aside a million dollars um, in, a, in a small business loan fund. We're giving loans of up to $15,000. Um, we have, that, that, that application process has since been closed because we received um, over 400 applications. 262 of those applications were qualified and there was $3.5 million worth of asks. Wow. And we have $1 million right now. So we'll be getting They'll be making some recommendations, I believe, this Friday and then trying to get that money out the door next week. And then we are looking for ways to find more money to support our small businesses. Um, if you have questions about, and those are just a couple of things we're doing. If you have questions about, um, if you have a, a business in Tacoma and you have questions about support, we have a website, makeittacoma.org, all one word, makeittacoma.org, and all of the resources for local businesses is on that website, whether it be access to SBA loans, we are also providing technical assistance um, to people who need to, you know, there are a lot of businesses out there who've never had to apply for an SBA loan or go through a government process. And we know that that's not the easiest process to walk through. Um, and so we also, um, in partnership with the regional SBA, are providing a technical assistance. So makeittacoma.org is a great place to get all of the information I didn't share, but those are just a couple of things we're doing here in Tacoma. That's great. So makeittacoma.org. Yeah. Council members, Ladenberg or Campbell, anything you want to add on this question and in concern of our local small businesses? I'll jump in on this and I hope you can hear me okay. I'm having small technical difficulties here. Um, so as a uh, longtime small business owner myself, of course, this is, it's very much close to home uh, as far as what we're doing for our small businesses. Pretty similar to Pierce County. We're doing, uh, uh, we set aside $650,000 initially for 10,000, uh, for up to $10,000 for companies of uh, 10 employees or less. Uh, and they can apply through our economic development department, give Betty Capistani a call. I don't have the website right in front of me. 
Um, we've also been working uh, with the uh, Economic Development Board, making sure that we're uh, across the board trying to help businesses uh, get through this time and then begin working on a plan so that we can open up in a responsible and compassionate way that allows people to get back to work. We've also uh, signed on to a few letters. One was to uh, ask for, and we were able to receive a delay in uh, property tax. So businesses that would normally owe property tax April 30th, uh, we've gotten Give another month on that uh, till the end of May. Uh, so any property tax that you have to have to pay, um, and uh, we also are, you know, working and talking with the governor about what opening up would look like. Great, thank you, Councilmember Campbell. Councilmember Lattenberg, any? No, Marty covered all of that perfectly. Okay. Okay, great. I'll talk a little bit about the state level. The Department of Commerce had um, issued $5 million for small grants for businesses up to $10,000, um, up to 10 employees. So um, applications have been flooding in, we know, and we also know that that amount um, will not nearly cover uh, the need in our small businesses. Rules have been adapted. Um, our Liquor and Control Board has adapted some rules in order to be flexible for our restaurants and dining establishments and small businesses. In addition, the Federal CARES Act has uh, small business loans available uh, to folks. A lot of this information of where they can apply and the applications are on coronavirus.wa.org. Again, that's coronavirus.wa.org. And legislators are working tirelessly to take a look at all of the essential businesses that are currently operating and the many requests that are coming in uh, for industry that are not operating currently and finding a way of determining how we can reopen those businesses and allow those businesses to get back to work and have their employees come back and get back to work in a way that also provides uh, social distancing uh, guidance and in addition, make sure that you know once we uh, get back up and operational, we don't want to have a, a, a recess or relapse, if you will, um, and all this hard work of, of folks in our community and our neighbors who have been social distancing to get this curve flattening that we don't just flip a switch and then um, get back to where we are and, and be in quarantine for much longer. So there are small business recovery efforts being um, underway in the governor's office and in the legislature to identify ways to get those small businesses back and, and up and running in a way that also protects our neighbors and our most vulnerable and flattens the curve. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Chen if he can maybe talk a little bit about um, the impact of, of the essential businesses, but then also um, what it would look like coming back for those those businesses who are struggling right now and, and really are um, in a lot of pain for their workers and their business. Yeah, I think this is a, a real challenge for us. I think, you know, we know that even, it, it, you know, outside of the coronavirus COVID-19 situation, we know that income um, and you know, socioeconomic success is very correlated to people's health. Now in this situation, of course, we also know that um, close physical contact helps spread this disease. Um, we also know that the longer we do this, not only is it going to impact businesses, it's also going to impact people's social well-being and their mental health. Um, so this is a very challenging situation, but I want to go back to something I said earlier. The, the, the measures, although they are severe and um, require um, a lot of cooperation, and we've been very fortunate that people have been cooperating and you know staying at home and and of course you know washing their hands, um, staying six feet away from other people, things like that. Um, it, it is helping, but you, you know you've probably heard this term of flattening the curve. Um, we're flattening the rate of increase, but we're not flattening the curve yet, right? I mean, we were getting for the past week, um, new cases in the range of 30 to 45. Um, today, you know, we reported that we, we only have 23. So maybe we are starting to flattening out, but it means the cases are still going up, right? So it's just that we were in a linear rate of increase, a straight line 
rate of increase rather than this exponential rate of increase we were a few weeks ago, but we're still increasing. Okay, so even with the um, restrictions that we're under, we're still increasing. Now, hopefully in the next few days, we'll start to see some flattening. Um, but as I said, 99% of people in Pierce County have no immunity to this new virus. It's not like flu season where people either can get a shot or maybe they got the flu the previous season, so they have immunity and there are a lot of people in the community, so there is community immunity. So it, you know, if someone's sick, there's kind of like this protective ring of people around them, right? Right now, 99% of people are not immune to this. And when, whenever we ease up, more people are gonna get infected. Now, our hope is that several things will happen. One is that we can figure out what the data is that we need, that our testing capacity will go up so that whenever we start to loosen things up, we can monitor what that's doing uh, you know, without letting things get too loose. Um, I know I was speaking with the county executive a week or two ago and he made the analogy like when we implemented all these um, restrictions, it's almost like we flipped the light switch off, right? Now we don't want to flip it back on, that would be disastrous. Um, and if you want to extend analogies, how do we turn the dimmer back up, right? And if we turn it too quickly, it's going to cause problems. So this is just a real big challenge right now. No one knows the answer about how we're going to do, uh, turn that dimmer back up. I think when you talk about small businesses, there are even variations, right? The definition of a small business um, it goes from some fairly large um, companies down to, you know, mom and pop, you know, sole proprietors. Um, but we also know that many people, uh, well, many of these small, the, the, the very small businesses, right, they're, they're more agile so that they could make gradual changes in what they do or modify how they do their business so that they could um, do it in a safer way. Um, and, and so there may be some advantage of working with that group. Um, we also know that many of those businesses are the ones that are teetering on the edge, right? Um, the, not only of their business maybe collapsing, but also, you know, their owners not being able to pay the rent um, on their own homes or pay them, you know, or pay the mortgage, right? Um, so, in terms of equity, we need to pay attention to um, the small businesses, right? That, that has to be part of the consideration. Uh, you know, big companies like Boeing have, have more buffer, have more reserves, um, but then the smaller businesses and also the people who work in low wage businesses like in food service, right? Um, we, like the last recession we had, because the health department regulates food workers and restaurants, we noticed that that business did not decline for us because a lot of people who are losing better paying jobs trickled down into the food service sector. But right now that, that sector is quite hurt, right? I mean, sure you can order takeout, but a lot of people are laid off right now from that sector. Even fast food, right? Fast food, you look at the amount of spending that used to go through fast food severely wrong um, in the spending. So I, I'm not providing any answers here. I'm just saying there are a lot of challenges and we're trying to navigate that forward um, as we balance health, uh, you, you know, the infectious disease health with social health as well as economic health. Thank you. And this Sorry. question is, Oh yeah, yeah, Marty, please go ahead. And I'm going to move on to the next question. Can I just yeah. add on that Thank real you. quick? You know, statistics showing that the first week we were at restaurants were about 10% of capacity because of takeout. Now they're up to 20%. So if people have a chance, please get out. Um, you know, if it's something that you can get takeout from a local restaurant, uh, you know, it keeps keeps the lights on, keeps them kind of uh, uh, going, and that's good. And I think we need to, when we're opening up, we need to look at criteria as much as industry. Because uh, a, a hairstylist with a single chair inside a thousand square foot uh, place that's scheduling people so they're not overlapping can create a very, very safe environment. Uh, but if you're trying to do a. 
So I think we need to as much as look at industries, look at criteria. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna uh, jump up to, or actually I'm gonna ask one question that's related and I'm gonna jump back up to a question from Miriam on nonprofits. But let me just ask this question because it's related to the commentary and see if anybody wants to add. And the, the question is this, has the county or city begun designing programs for retraining and job placement for all of the food and beverage folks and other small business workers who will be displaced after this? That's a great question. So as the county yep. or city, um, began Peter, what is your future of workforce? Yep. I was going to say that's that's a really great question, and and uh, Council Member Campbell and I both serve on the workforce um, executive committee, and so that is that is a conversation that we're starting to have because that's where that's where it would actually happen, and so we are looking at how are we going to retrain this community, and and the question is also going to be what kind of jobs are going to come out, you know, after after every event a new economy emerges. And it will be interesting to see what kind of new economy emerges from this. But we are having those conversations. We don't have anything specifically um, done and in design yet, but it is a conversation that we're having. and We hope to be, be releasing something soon. Great. And I should also add that this is not just a conversation we're having in Tacoma and Pierce County, that workforce um, development councils across the state and across the United States are having these very same conversations. And, and it's not just food and beverage workers that, that yeah. need retraining. We want a lot of them to get back to work in their restaurants where they're skilled at. Um, but we really know, I mean, this showed a shortage of nursing that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, we already had a shortage of mental health workers. So there's lots of opportunity where we can, uh, as you say, new, new economies emerge, making sure that Pierce County is in the best position to recover. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Any any other comments on that? Okay, I'm going to move up to a question from Miriam, Dr. Chen, or anyone else. Do you have any insights for nonprofits with large fundraising events scheduled for the end of June about whether we will be able to hold them or not? We know that our nonprofits make uh, the bulk of their money in order to sustain their operations for the year and and help the folks that they have a mission or a calling to assist. And and a lot of that comes from these large fundraisers. So, do you have any? advice perhaps on large fundraisers at the end of June? This is another very difficult situation. Uh, you know, we know that nonprofits, um, whether it's, you know, our museums or social service agencies um, depend on this type of generosity from the community. I think the general feeling is it's going to be extremely difficult for us to envision having these large events occurring in the near future. Um, you know, um, certainly big events like, you know, the Western Washington Fair, but, you know, for many of our nonprofits, when they do their fundraisers, there are hundreds of people there. And we just, uh, I just uh, am not optimistic that we're going to be able to allow that in the near future. All right, can I respond? Yes, please, thank you. Thanks, um, this is a challenge. Um, I met with the Human Services Coalition yesterday and that's one of the issues that uh, they brought up is how can they raise money? Uh, as you mentioned, you know, nonprofits, are, they're a nonprofit <laughs> and their main source of revenue is usually their big annual event um, plus a few grants here and there too. But I think they have to start thinking outside the box, um, you know, maybe do some Facebook fundraising a GoFundMe account do some kind of online event you know a virtual event that they can publicize to their list uh, because they all have lists they do this in invitation to their to their um, events you know so it needs to go out to that um, um, my son can't believe this I'm gonna say this um, just turned 50 so we had a, a virtual birthday party for him, you know, so we all got online, waved each other, saying happy birthday to him. I mean, it was, you know, there's like 30 of us online. It's nothing like an event for a nonprofit, but people are starting. We have a grandson this afternoon. We're going to um, a parade in front of his house. It's his birthday. So we're just going to, in our cars, parade, honk our horns, wave, make signs, happy birthday. You know, I mean, we're trying to do things like that to stay engaged. Um, 
it's uh, so Marion, you know, it, it is challenging. Um, I do know that the Small Business Association also has loan program for nonprofits. And from yesterday's conversation with the Human Services Coalition, some of them are having some problems getting their um, applications um, facilitated through some banks. Some banks have done it really quickly and very well. Some other banks have not. But that's a, a resource that nonprofits have to try to kind of help them out, you know, carry them through too. Um, but I, that's, you know, other than that, it's it's you, like Dr. Chin says, we just can't have these events. And we just are really not sure yet when those large events can, you know, where we can start congregating again in large, large groups like that. Um, it's too early to tell. Thank you. I'm gonna move on to anyone else. No, okay. Moving on to a question about housing and what is going on with the deferment of mortgage payments, not only in our state but on a federal level. Um, how are we going to respond to all the rental properties to end any evictions until we are freed from stay-at-home orders? Um, and then there's one other um, related to rent, and I'll ask that, and then we can kind of dive into those questions on rent and mortgages. Rent moratorium, what happens after state of emergency is over? Will both April and May rent be required? People have not been working and will not have saved money to become current on rent. You know, this is a, a really important conversation and questions. Um, and thank you for those who raised them, both from a renter's perspective, as well as a landlord perspective, who also um, are working to, to pay their mortgages. Um, and, and we already had a housing um, shortage and crisis mm -hmm. prior to COVID uh, that the legislature, you know, invested um, significant millions of dollars in, in, um, into housing on a continuum. Um, and then with COVID hit, then that, um, you know, threw everything up in the air and certainly rent is a, is a concern. Uh, at a state level, there have been groups meeting both um, renters um, or tenants and landlords um, across the state, along with um, lending institutions from credit unions to our banks, trying to figure out what this gonna, is going to look like. We don't know, we haven't heard from the governor's office when the moratorium, um, if it will be extended on evictions. There's a, there is a moratorium on evictions currently. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the rent doesn't have to be paid. It, um, the expectation is that, that rents will still likely be paid. I know that Pierce County, and I'll pivot to Pierce County, if you want to talk about the rental assistance program um, that you've just funded. So there are, are programs that are being set up right now, and I'll, I'll move on to the county or the city if you want to respond, and then also give yeah. some state resources. Um, just real, yeah, sorry. It just uh, real, real quickly, a, a couple of things. One, so we we um, we went to work right away. I went to work right away on on rental assistance um, as soon as this happened. Um, if you so, let's talk about uh, foreclosures first or mortgages. If you have an an, an FHA loan, um, either with Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, so if you have a if, if you have if you have that, then you they have already taken steps. Um, to forego your mortgage payments. So there, if you go online, I know there's a lot of information about that. Um, the governor's uh, ev eviction moratorium actually expires on Friday the 17th in two days. Um, I like you haven't heard directly, but I have heard through different uh, people that it does look like he's probably gonna put something forward. Um, the city is preparing something just in case he does not put something forward. We wrote a letter to the governor about three weeks ago asking him to not only look at eviction, um, a moratorium on evictions, but also on fines and fees. Because even for those who are not paying their rent, they're, you know, $20 a day or $10 a day. And by the end of the month, it's as much as their rental payment was in the first place. So we're hoping that the governor will actually address um, fines and fees as, as well. We will be rolling out um, next week. Everything should be up and online, a $1.2 million rental assistance fund um, for people who live within the city of Tacoma. Um, and so that will be up. Look for those forms to be ready sometime next week. Um, and those payments, people say, what are you doing for landlords? The rental assistance payments that will be given out in Tacoma will go directly to landlords. So we're so landlords are saying, "What are you doing for me?" Well, number one, we're going to make sure you get the money directly 
Um, and so we're paying those rental payments to landlords and then still continuing um, to have conversations with local banks um, and people in the banking industry for the private banking industry to take a stance on, 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 um, on mortgages to help, to help citizens through this tough time. So. Thank you, Mayor. Council, council members. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, the county council approved some funding to go for um, a rental assistance, and it's not nearly what the, the city was able to do. Um, ours is $250,000 for homeless services and, and rental ser uh, assistance. Um, our human services department actually opted to use that money specifically for um, rental assistance. And so that's, that is dedicated to that. In addition, our department also gets from the Department of Commerce, um, $1.6 million in emergency funds for homelessness. Um, so it's not exactly the same thing, but um, you know, there's a lot of efforts going uh, in regards to homeless prevention too. So even as people are having problems keeping their house, they're staying housed, then they're moving into homelessness and then some of these other funds can assist them in that way too. And I will just add that last night's council meeting, uh, the Pierce County Council unanimously and with bipartisan effort uh, sent a letter to the governor asking for an extension of the uh, eviction, uh, stay on evictions. Thank you. Um, next question, I'm going to move on to Dr. Chen. And the, is the CDC wanting everyone to wear masks when they go out? Would you kindly provide us with what are we supposed to do when we're out and about? And if we are taking our family for a walk, what should we wear? So currently, the CDC does have a recommendation for that. I think um, part of the challenge was that it was rolled out in kind of a chaotic way. So um, if you want to go by the letter, yes, um, the CDC currently has a recommendation that all people wear a cloth face covering, um, not necessarily a mask. Um, and the idea there, uh, we know that masks in general um, help better to prevent someone from spreading their germs to other people. And so the logic behind this recommendation is that there may be some people, you know, as I said, the, the virus is quite widespread throughout our community right now. Someone may get infected, and this is the same for anything, whether it's the cold, the flu, or many other infectious diseases, that you um, can start, and the, the virus spreads throughout your body, and you can start secreting some virus, um, and therefore spread it before you feel sick. Um, you know, not everyone, but some people, you know, they, they, they're, they're shedding virus before they are symptomatic. Um, so the logic here is because it is quite widespread in the community right now, um, we may um, have some benefit by having people wear some kind of face covering so that if they were to cough, sneeze, have a runny nose, whatever, um, that they're not spreading it to other people in the community. Great. Thank you, Dr. Chen. And I'm going to ask one other question, and this will go to Dr. Chen, and it says, I was sick, very sick, and I believe I had a false negative. I'm finally getting better, but being asthmatic, I don't want to go back to work without receiving the antibodies test. Where can I get this done locally, and are antibody tests available here in Pierce County? Antibody testing right now is very problematic. I do not believe there's an FDA-approved test right now. Um, there... I can tell you every day I'm getting emails from people around the world trying to sell the health department antibody tests, as well as masks, PPE, and other things. Um, and you may have seen in the news, for example, down in Texas, an emergency room spent a, a lot of money buying the test, and they found out the test was unreliable. The company claimed it had FDA approval. It did not. Um, I, I believe there is one company that has gotten what's called a EUA, it's an emergency use. Um, many other places have um, applied for EUAs, but I'm saying only one has been granted that. Um, I would be extremely careful about looking for that right now. Um, 
there, there has been, for example, in, I think it was Florida, where there was some concern that this was being used by um, one of the university hospitals down there was using this test. Um, but I do want to back up though. I mean, when you look at the state testing data for other respiratory illnesses, you will see that, you know, it's starting in like end of February going into March that um, in what we call ILI, influenza-like illnesses, there was, I mean, there was the, the peak of influenza B um, earlier in the season, and then there's a small peak for influenza A, and then there was a big peak of ILI after that. And if you look at the, the rates of positivity, there also was a big peak in influenza test, uh, positive influenza tests at that time, as well as tests for uh, viruses like uh, RSV, um, a respiratory syncytial virus, and several other respiratory viruses. So just the fact that you've been sick does not necessarily mean that you had a false positive test, that it's also um, possible that you had influenza or one of the other respiratory viruses. Um, and this is very, it, it gets challenging because, um, you know, you, maybe you took care of this at home and, or you went to see a provider and the provider did not test for those viruses. Um, so, but, you know, at this time, um, antibody testing is not a very good strategy. Thank you, Dr. Chen. This next question is going to go to the mayor and, and our um, wonderful council members. Um, as a, and this is from a restaurant's um, general manager down on Tacoma Waterfront, so Reston Way. And, and uh, the question is, as a restaurant GM from the Tacoma Waterfront, do we need to forget about planning 4th of July festivities on Reston or still attempt to make plans? If you would kindly ask that very important question that I know a lot of families and <laughs> those who are participating in parades and other things are asking right now. Well, as that restaurant owner may be aware of, or anybody else may be aware of, um, we went out for an RFP for this year's 4th of July festival. And that RFP was awarded to Metro Parks. And um, I have not heard officially what events Metro Parks will be continuing to produce this summer. So unfortunately, I don't have an answer about what's gonna happen on the 4th of July. Obviously, a lot of it depends on, um, on what's happening in our community at the time um, and whether or not, sorry, there was a fly, um, and, and, and whether or not we will be at a position to where we can hold an event like that. Um, I, I, I wanna double back to something Dr. Chen said and, and that people are hearing a lot. We, it's getting better, absolutely. We are flattening the curve, but we're only flattening the curve because we're abiding by the rules that have been given to us. We are, we are honoring the orders and the social distancing and all of that. The only way to make sure that we continue on this trend is to continue to live by the rules um, that we are currently in. So I don't have a definitive answer, but I will say if, if we wanna to continue to see the little success that we've seen, by these orders, we are going to have to continue to abide by them, whatever they are. Thank you, Mayor. Council members, do you want to comment on this? I, I would just, you know, agree with, you know, what Victoria said, but also, you know, kind of reinforce what Dr. Chin has been talking about. You know, Fourth of July celebration down on the waterfront is a huge crowd. Um, I don't know close, maybe Victoria, you know, 100,000 people over the yeah, course of the day. Pretty big. Yeah. yeah and so it, it's just going to be dependent um, on, you know, what the governor says uh, in regards to, you know, getting back together in, in these large crowds. There's been some speculation, maybe Dr. Chen can speak to it a little bit, but this, this may last up until um, fall, you know, September, you know, don't plan on anything until then. And it's kind of anecdotal, um, but, you know, I, it's it's just um, there's so many unknowns, I guess, in regards to how we're going to you know get out of this and and what kind of um, speed we will get healthy again. Great, thank you. Next question has to do with um, and many of you mentioned large gatherings, and, and this question is for Mark. And not sure if this was asked, but when your neighbor regularly throws outdoor backyard bonfire parties, is there anything that we can do? 
Does anyone want to take this from a county or, or city jurisdictional perspective? So I, I can tell you one thing not to do. Please don't dial 911. Yeah. Um, uh, please do not, let's not inundate our first responders who are responding to emergencies um, with that. If someone is not abiding by, um, by uh, the order, um, there is a non-emergency line, and I believe it's 253-798-4512. Um, call the non-emergency line. Um, if it's someone who's consistently doing it, definitely report it. Um, I will, you know, hopefully that we'll get a chance to drive by and educate people. But I will also say this, we are not giving tickets. We are not arresting people. We are not taking people to jail for not abiding by the order. Um, we hope that, that Tacomans and people in Pierce County will be responsible and do the right thing. But if someone is not, then by all means, please call the non-emergency line. Thank you, Mayor. Council members? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I'm kind of interested in whether this person is concerned about the fire part of it or the backyard party part of it. You know, if it's a real congregation of people, that's, you know, that's one thing. If it's a, you know, if we have a fire ban or something like that, that's a different phone number to call. Um, yeah, I, I think the question was about the gatherings. Yeah, yeah, okay. Great. And then this last question I'm going to throw out to Dr. Chen, if maybe you could um, round us out before we do some closing comments. And and if you could talk about the latest count of confirmed and fatalities in Pierce County. Right. So, um, as I said, uh, for the past week or um, week and a half, we were fluctuating around 30 to 45 new cases a day. And today we reported that there were 23 new cases. So we, uh, we hope we're flattening the curve. Um, our cumulative case count is a little over a thousand. Um, so that's, that's where we are now. Um, I do want to say, um, I know the mayor has talked to me about this. We are going to be putting out more information on our website. So those of you who are not aware, our website, www.tpchd.org slash coronavirus. Um, you can look at the numbers. But I know the mayor and other people have asked me about what about the racial ethnic mix of the people who are getting sick. Lots of concerns um, from around the nation um, about that. Uh, we've been looking at this. We had some concerns about the data quality. We feel com comfortable enough that we are now going to be reporting that weekly. So that should be up on our website. If not right now, it should be up there later. We're also going to be reporting some other data. A lot of questions about how do we um, see how many people have recovered. Um, that's a very challenging number to get because that's just all calculated differently by different people. But usually you need to wait at least two weeks, you know, maybe four weeks before you can tell whether someone's recovered or not. So we know that the public wants to know this information. And we're trying to figure some of that out. We will continue to roll out more data on our website when we feel that we have good data and have a good way to report it. Um, but certainly people who want to know about the numbers, every day at two o'clock, we will post new numbers for the day and they'll be on our website, www.tpchd.org slash coronavirus. Thank you, Dr. Chen. As we close out, I wanna thank my colleagues for joining us and give you an opportunity to, to say any last words about resources or ways to, to connect with your city or county in terms of learning more about how we can be good neighbors with each other and, and stay healthy. So I'll turn it over to Councilman, La Councilmember Ladenberg, if you wanna say a few closing comments. Uh, well, first, I just want to thank uh, you, you know, for hosting this. This has been uh, a good opportunity for us to, you know, meet, quote, unquote, meet with the public. Um, it's kind of a fun thing to do. Um, I, I didn't mention earlier that I'm the chair of the Human Services Committee. And so my interest in this um, is kind of centered around the issues that come in front of us as a committee, you know, homeless population, we talked about, you know, homelessness and housing and food banks. We didn't talk a lot about that today. Other human services, um, those are the things that I am um, in the process of working with the people that are our providers in those areas. 
Um, I also appreciate us being able to work together, us, the state, uh, the city, other cities in our uh, in our county, and then of course, county government and the health department has been phenomenal through this. I do wanna give a shout out to the county's emergency management department. Mm -hmm. um, they've been huge at managing this emergency um, and working really closely with the health department and trying to get those kind of um, focuses and uh, coordination and all everything done. And they've done it very, very well. Um, um, you, you know, all of us in government, we are obviously focusing so much right now on COVID, but you know, we, we're still doing the rest of our job too. Um, there's a lot of things that are still happening in, in the county that we're working on. I'm particularly working on affordable housing strategy, which is key uh, in regards to what's happening right now um, and coming out of it, making sure that people do have housing. Um, we have a work release facility from Department of Corrections. It's going to be built or in our community, my district, about six blocks from my house. Um, and then I'm also working, continuing to work on behavior health issues and I'm on a planning committee um, in regards to that. I just wanna thank everyone for tuning in. Um, uh, this is, as I mentioned before, it's just been a fun and really fruitful uh, discussion. And I hope other people that have had questions, um, if they haven't had those answered, you know, please, you know, just uh, web, we have web pages, we have emails, just uh, email us and we'll try to get you the resources that you need. Um, so thank you again, and thanks everyone for sheltering in place and for uh, being safe at home. Thank you, Council Member Campbell. I think we lost him. Did we lose him? Mayor Woodards. Um, great, I, I too, Maury, just wanna thank you for your leadership um, and, for, and for putting this together and for all of my colleagues. Um, who are who were a part of this today, and I, I do I can't say it enough. I can't say thank you enough to Dr. Chen, and his staff at the health department, um, for the work that they're doing on behalf of our community. He they are on the front lines, um, and so I just again want to express my sincere appreciation to Dr. Chen and Dr. Chen. I'll say it every time I see you. Please let all of your staff know how much we appreciate the work that they're doing. I would be remiss if I didn't also say thank you to all of our first responders, whether you are a, a firefighter or a police officer or a healthcare worker um, or a bus driver or a home healthcare nurse, or you're working in a restaurant or a grocery store, or you know, um, uh, that, that, that um, definition is changing rapidly um, because of the times that we're in. Um, I, I just want to be transparent to everyone and say that um, as, as we all know that this is a difficult time. And um, frankly, it's a difficult time for us as elected leaders. Um, I know everyone who knows me knows I'm a hugger and I'm a people person. And so the first thing I'll do is give everybody a virtual hug um, because I miss them myself and I miss seeing and interacting with everybody. But I know that we're doing the right thing as difficult as it is because of the results that we're seeing. Um, it is a tough time. It's a lonely time. It can even be a sad time. Um, but I wanna remind us that, that we are strong and we are resilient. And, and, and it's okay to have bad moments in this time. There are lots of resources. If you go to the city of Tacoma's webpage, we um, yesterday started releasing information about hotlines and opportunity places that you can call if you're, if you're having a bad day and you need to talk to someone or you don't know what to do. Um, you may be at home alone, but you're not alone. And so I just wanna remind everybody we're here to help. Um, it, it might get a little bit darker before we see the full sunshine, but, it, but we will. Um, we will, we, we see the sunshine out today, we'll be able to live that sunshine again, um, and we will get through this and we will be stronger because we got through it together. So thank you and everyone hang in there. Thank you, Mayor. Dr. Chen, any last commentary you want to make? Yeah, two things. One is, um, I mentioned our website in terms of a resource. Um, also another way, um, if people do need to reach us, um, there is a call center, the Emergency Operations Center, which is 253-798-7970. 
Um, they can also uh, call the health department, although that's a little more complicated process. But last thing I want to say, I just want to reiterate what um, other people have said. Um, you know, we really appreciate that people are staying home and slowing the spread of disease. Um, the rate of increase is flattening, but curve is not quite flattening yet. Um, the measures are working. But now more than ever, we must continue our commitment to the proven measures that help protect our community, and we must keep it up and not let us guard them. So thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank Dr. Chen, Council Members Ladenberg and Campbell, our, our mayor, City of Tacoma, Mayor Victoria Woodards, um, for joining us. Thank you to all of you that we couldn't get to our questions. Uh, if you didn't get your question answered, please do reach out to us at a state level. Coronavirus.wa.gov is a great resource, whether you're an employer or trying to figure out how you navigate employment security. Um, and I would be remiss if I don't mention that we have a lot of folks who are food insecure right now and um, our food banks are in dire need. So if you could kindly go to WashingtonFoodFund.org or if you're able to give blood, our blood banks are in desperate need for blood, not only for the COVID patients that they're trying to serve, but those who have had car accidents, other heart issues, we need blood all the time and our blood banks are suffering as a result. Thank you to all who um, ask the question. Thanks for my colleagues. And until we see you again, stay home, stay healthy and wash your hands. Thank you.